Our Wednesday Luke study, uh, we're in Luke chapter 5. We're going to be starting about verse 17 or 18 is where we're at. And remember that as we've gone through here that you should have your little booklet. On your booklet, you should be over here where it says um, chapter 5. And you, it should, should say the, Jesus' authority and his mission. And we're down at verse, around verse 17, which if you look on your second page of that lesson, uh, which says main thoughts for the chapter. We notice Jesus in verses 1 through 11 calls his first disciples. And then verses 12 through 16, Jesus heals a leper. And so, so we're now in 17, and we're beginning this, this uh, section that deals with Jesus healing a paralyzed man. We're going to notice his, uh, Jesus call, uh, he calls Levi, and uh, uh, Levi makes him a feast. And then Jesus answers some questions. I don't know if we'll get all of that done. But that's where we're at. So we're in Luke chapter 5 in verse 17. And remember that Jesus had just healed a leper. He is working in and around the area of, Gal uh, of uh, Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. He's basically running around in these cities here. And he's teaching and preaching there uh, in that area. And it says in uh, Luke chapter uh, 5 and down here at verse 17, it says, One day... He was teach. Uh, first of all, is there any questions on the first 16 chapters anybody has, or maybe you found something out that's interesting, or something that you want to correct me on? No, 16 verse, verse, verse 16, chapter 5, verse 16. Where so is? Oh, I did. Okay, sorry. So, uh, in, in the first 16 verses, um, if you have a question, let me know. We can cover it. Anybody have anything? All right, 17. It says, And one day he was teaching, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from, from every village in, uh, of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present for him to, uh, to perform healings. And some men were carrying on a, a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of him, but not finding any way to bring him in. Because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles with his stretcher into the, middle of the, uh, into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. And seeing their faith, he said, friends, uh, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God alone? But Jesus, aware of their, of their reasoning, answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your heart? which is easier to say, your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, get up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, or I say to you, get up and pick up your stretcher and go home. And immediately he got up before them and picked up what he had been laying on and went home glorifying God. And they were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God. And they were filled with fear, saying, we have seen remarkable things today. And so I read all that for you because I want you to notice this part here where Jesus points out in verse 24, uh, but so that you may know that, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. It's interesting that this section starts off in verse 17 with one day that Jesus is teaching and there were Pharisees and teachers of the law. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were generally looked at as what? Or as who? Okay, they're the leaders. They're the ones that would have authority. They're the ones that would have the right to tell people what to do, how to do it, those kind of things. They looked up to those individuals. And so what you're seeing here is not just simply Jesus pointing out that there were some Pharisees there, but you're, you're seeing the difference between the authority that people have taken and the authority that Jesus actually has. And even today, there are religious leaders that take authority on themselves to do certain things, which in fact, they don't have the right to do, and they need to be listening to Jesus. And the reason we need to listen to Jesus is because Jesus performs miracles. He does all these things. And remember that as, as uh, Luke was recording this, one of the things he mentioned as we began this whole section is that they were looking at Jesus as one having authority. And so he's giving us all these all these examples of Jesus having authority. And so this is one of those, but it's interesting that it starts off that one day he was teaching and there, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the, of the law sitting there who had come from every village, from, from every village of Galilee and Judea and from, and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present for him 
to perform healings. Now, uh, there's a couple of there's a couple of things in here. Uh, first of all, it says the, the Pharisees and the teachers were coming. And you might say, well, they're coming to learn of him. But uh, actual, in actuality, they're, they're generally down here. Most of the Pharisees and Sadducees, they're down here in Judea. And so they, they had come all the way up here to Galilee. Okay? The only reason they would make such a trip is because they want to check out the teaching that's going on. Because they considered themselves the authority. Matter of fact, when Jesus was talking about them, uh, in Matthew chapter 25, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 24, he starts off this discussion about who they are in, uh, in verse, um, it's not 24, it's 23. Yeah, uh, Matthew 23, as Jesus is talking about the Pharisees, he says in, in, verse, in verse 1, then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples and saying, the scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Now, who was Moses? The lawgiver. So the scribes and the Pharisees had taken over Moses' place. They sat themselves in the, uh, in the position of Moses in order to tell the people what the law says. And, and if they're teaching, the, the priests are the ones who are supposed to do that. And, and so they, they are supposed to be individuals who do that. Now, God, God never set up the, the structure of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He didn't set up that structure. But they were looked at as the religious leaders in their day, and so therefore they seated themselves on the seat of Moses. And Jesus says in verse 3 of Matthew 23, Therefore all that they tell you do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. And you might say, well, why does he tell them that if they're really not the religious leaders? Well, because back then, if you wanted to know what God said, you had to go to somebody who had a copy of the law. The Pharisees and the scribes, the, the job of the scribes was to make copies of the law. So if you wanted to know something about what the law said, you would go to somebody who had a Bible or somebody who had the Old Testament, and that would be one of the scribes or one of the Pharisees. So if you wanted to know what God said, you'd go to the Pharisees, and they could tell you or read you what God says. And Jesus is saying, when they're telling you what God says, do what they say, but don't do what they do. And in other words, Jesus is saying, go to them and, the, and they can tell you what, what the word of God says, but then don't do their interpretation of what it says. Don't follow their rules for, for trying to keep what the, what the word of God says. And, but they seated themselves on the seat of Moses, and, and that's why Jesus is mentioning them here. And I suggest to you that's the reason why, why they're, they're being here. And it says in Luke 5, verse 17, uh, one day he was teaching, uh, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from, the, from every village of Galilee and Judea and from, from Jerusalem. So they were coming from everywhere. Not only were they coming from around there where Jesus was at, but they were coming all the way from Judea. So they're coming up to find out what he's teaching, what he's doing, some of them, uh, might have been sincere, but very few of them actually were sincere. We know that Nicodemus was sincere. He really wanted to know what God said. So there might have been a few, but they were few and far, bet far between. They basically came up for the purpose of finding out what he was going to say and what he was teaching so that they might uh, uh, be able to say, okay, you guys can listen to him or no, you shouldn't be listening to him. Uh, and then if you go to the end of chapter 5 of Luke, uh, what you find out is Jesus has this question about fasting. He has, he has a question about uh, Levi and the dinner that he made. And, and all of those are indications or are, uh, or, or are events that are going to show you the difference between people who claim to be religious and Jesus who we're supposed to follow. And so I, I just wanted to point that out to you because I think it's interesting that it mentions specifically the Pharisees and the teachers. And they were coming to him. Now, what's also interesting in this verse, it says, and the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healings. And I think that the emphasis of this is that here you have the leaders, uh, the leaders of the people who are the Pharisees and the scribes. They're the ones who are supposed to tell you the law, but they can't heal anybody. They can't help anybody. They're, they're, they're worthless when it comes to the problems and the needs of the people. Jesus, on the other hand, here it says, has the power to heal. Jesus is going to show you which, which, 
group or, or who it is you should be listening to. Should you be listening to the religious leaders of, of your day or should you be listening to Jesus? And that's why I tell you, don't listen to me. Make sure that you're following what God says. Make sure you check everything that I tell you. I can't, I can't preach to you like Jesus preaches to you. Jesus says, I say to you. Mike has to say, I think this is what God says to you. That's what I have to do. But Jesus says, I say. And so I, I, I don't want you to, to just skip, skip over this little verse because I think this is the, the introduction, you might say, to what's going on in here as Jesus is going to be performing miracles and he is going to be the one who performs the signs, not the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So the religious people of their day that they looked up to, they don't have God's power. But Jesus does have God's power because Jesus is the one who we're supposed to listen to. Verse 18, and some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were, and they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of him. So th there's these guys, and you remember, uh, if the scribes and the Pharisees came all the way from Judea, then you realize that Jesus is getting pretty popular. When you get pretty popular and you're out in public, what happens? You have crowds, right? All these crowds come. And so there's these guys trying to bring in their buddy on a stretcher, and the crowds are uh, around the house, the crowds are around the door, and they're not letting uh, these guys, you know, get in there to see Jesus. And so it says in verse 19, but not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles uh, with his stretcher into the middle of the, cr of the crowd in front of Jesus. Now, in, in their day and time and in third world countries, generally speaking, uh, uh, they have houses, a lot of them have flat roofs on them, and they actually live on top of the flat roof. That's why when Jesus said, what, what you hear in secret, tell on the housetops, that doesn't mean you stand on your pitched roof and scream it to your, to your neighbors. What he's talking about is, is what you hear in, in private, go out in public and tell people where you live. They, they lived on top of their houses. But not only, not only did they have flat roofs, but some of the houses, because if you make another story on your house, it costs more money, okay? If you, if you don't have enough money to, to build that second platform, you would have tile. And, and the tile would just basically, you know, like shingles, but, but, they're, but they're tiles, you know, the kind of Spanish tiles that you and I um, uh, are used to, um, and, and, and so there, there was probably a section where they were able to go up uh, on the roof, and then there's a section that was just tile that had tile over it, and that apparently was close to where Jesus was at, so they started taking those tiles apart. Now, uh, you might say, wow, they're destroying this guy's house. Well, they are taking it, they are taking the tiles apart, but those kind of tiles are meant to take out and put in, they're, they're fairly easy to do, uh, and, and so it's not like, you know, you got to nail them down or like, like you and I think of our shingles and those things that take a lot of work. Uh, they're just basically tiles. You pick them up and you move them over. And if they break, you put a new one down. Uh, and, and, but they, they are, you know, doing something to this man's property. Uh, and it says in verse 19, but not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let, down, and let him down through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. Now, you also have to realize that if somebody starts removing tiles, even though you can remove them, if they've been up there for quite a while, there's dust and dirt and all kinds of stuff on them, you start moving them, what happens? Stuff starts falling inside, right? So, so you can imagine as the dust starts falling inside, people are kind of looking up, well, what, you know, what's going on? Uh, and so everybody's attention is up on the roof, even though Jesus is there in the house. They're, they're looking at the ceiling, and the ceiling's coming apart, and all of a sudden they see some guy you know, being lowered down in a stretcher. Uh, and, and so it's, it's, it's quite an obvious activity that's going on. Now remember, the scribes and the Pharisees were there as well, Okay. And it says in verse 20, and seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven you. Now, notice that he doesn't say friends. He says friend. So apparently he's talking to the cripple guy. Apparently he's talking to the, to the paralytic. And it says, seeing their faith, he said. Now, how do you see faith? By the actions. You see faith by the activity that you do. Somebody says, I have faith in God. Well, do you ever pray? No. Do you ever read your Bible? No. Uh, do you ever go to church? No. What can you be pretty sure of? 
He doesn't, have, he doesn't quite understand what faith is, does he? Because if he understood what faith is, he'd be doing some of those things uh, and, and putting his trust in God anyway. So they see his faith. Faith is something you can see. And I believe that's what, that's what uh, James chapter uh, uh, 2 is talking about uh, when he says faith without works is dead. Faith without some kind of activity or some kind of deeds is worthless. To believe something and not act on it is worthless. It doesn't do you any good. Uh, if you believe something and you really believe it, then you'll act on it. And so that's what Jesus was saying. He says he sees their he sees your he sees their faith. And as a result of that, even before they asked, Jesus says to them, "Friend, your sins are forgiven you." Even before they asked. Now, probably that's not what they were going to ask Jesus when they showed up. They probably won't lo weren't lowering the guy so Jesus could forgive him for his sins. That's probably not why they were doing that, was it? Why were they doing it? They wanted him to be healed, right? But when, when Jesus sees their faith, he says their sins are forgiven. Now, uh, it doesn't matter how healthy you are. If your sins aren't forgiven you, what good does it do? It doesn't do any good in the long run, right? And if you're as sick as a dog, but you're forgiven, what good does that do you? Well, that's that's an expression Jesus didn't use it. I did. <laughs> that's a that's a, that, that's just a saying. If you've ever seen a dog throw up and stuff, they get sick, and you know. They're... I don't know. <laughs> yeah. it's, just, it's just an expression that means you're really sick. How's that? <laughs> okay, vet, veterinarians, let's move on. <laughs> All right, so he says, he says, friend, your your friend, your sins are forgiven you. Now, verse 21. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God alone? Now, as you, as you read this, uh, uh, notice that it says, the scribes and the Pharisees began reasoning, saying. So they're, so they're, they're thinking, they're, they're thinking among themselves, you know, who, who can do this? Uh, it doesn't necessarily say they're having a discussion about it, but what he's pointing out is the scribes and the Pharisees are the ones who would be thinking this. Okay? They're thinking this because they're the ones who, quote, are supposed to know the law. And so he says, the scribes and the Pharisees began reasoning, saying, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins? So blasphemy is what? What is blasphemy? I'm sorry? Acts against God? Okay. Well, what? Well, you can blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Okay, not believe in the miracles. Blasphemy is when you take something that belongs to God and you give it to somebody else or the attributes to somebody else. Like if I said, I'm God, what have I just done? I've just blasphemed. Why? Because I took a quality of God and made it mine. You see, I say, I have it. Well, when Jesus says, your sins are forgiven, the scribes and the Pharisees who were supposed to know the law, they said, well, God's the only one who can forgive sin. How can this man say your sins are forgiven you? Okay, now, we can certainly forgive one another's sins. But if I forgive your sin, does that mean God forgave your sin? No. no. Uh, if you want your sins really forgiven, God is the one who has to do it. Mm -hmm. So when they said, uh, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God alone? Either one of two things is happening. Either the scribes and the Pharisees are correct, and that is that only God can forgive sin, or they're, they're mistaken and, er, and other people can forgive sin besides God. Now, yes. Right. So are we praying for everyone or what? Yes. They're asking God to forgive all of us for all of our sins. Now, of course, of course that's contingent on us being faithful to God. Just because they ask it doesn't mean God's going to do it if we're not faithful to him. Right. 
But Jesus said uh, to the, about the people who crucified him, forgive them. <laughs> yeah, but we're supposed to have the same attitude. We're supposed to pray for people uh, to be forgiven and, and to be blessed. Yep. Okay, so uh, the question is, are they, are they making a statement that's wrong or are they making a statement that's true? And I think as we go through here, we're going to understand that the statement they're making is correct. It, it, it implies, or it, it doesn't literally state it, but the implication is that God's the only one who can really forgive sin. He's the one who can forgive sin. So for Jesus to say to this guy, your sins are forgiven, the Pharisees would, who are supposed to be the leaders and the, and the, the teachers, they would say, no, it's not right. Okay, And that's what they were doing. They were reasoning among themselves whether it was uh, in their heads or they were actually talking to each other, that th this is the question they came up with. Now, verse 22. But Jesus, aware of their reasonings, answered and said to them, so now he's addressing the scribes and the Pharisees. He says, why are you reasoning in your hearts? So notice that Jesus says they were thinking this in their heart. So they, it, it, they weren't necessarily having a discussion with each other about it. They were just thinking, he can't do that. You know, it, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of like if you see a, a, a thief taking something from the store, you think in your head, he can't do that. And then maybe you go tell somebody. But, but you f first think it in your heart. And so it says, uh, Jesus says, why are you reasoning in your heart? So one of the things that tells you already, Jesus knows what they're thinking, right? Now, do you know what your husband's thinking, Katie? <laughs> no, not this time. <laughs> <laughs> but but general, generally speaking, we don't we can't know what somebody else is thinking. We can guess at what they're thinking sometimes because we know them. We might make a pretty good educated guess, but we don't know what people are thinking. Jesus says, "I know what you're thinking." Jesus says, "I know what you're reasoning in your heart." Out of everything that's going on, Jesus says to them that he knows exactly what they're thinking because he turns his attention to the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, verse twenty-three. He says, which is easier to say, your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, get up and walk? Well, if you're just talking about speaking, both of those are equally easy to say, right? Your sins are forgiven, get up and walk. I mean, I just said both of those. That, that wasn't very hard. It, he's not talking about which is easier to say, as in vocalizing it. What he's saying is, which is easier to do? Which is easier to do? Okay, that's really what he's saying. And what he's saying is, which is easier to do? Say your sins are forgiven you, or to say get up and walk? Now, if only God can forgive sin, is it easy for me to say to somebody, your sins are forgiven you, and do it? No, I can't. If God's the only one who can forgive sin, I might say it, but it won't happen. Right? Yes. You can say that. Somebody that's done something to hurt you, right? I, I forgive you, and that counts, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean God forgave them, right. because they still need to make that right with God, right? Yes. So he didn't even have to ask to be forgiven, right? And the guy didn't even ask to be forgiven. Jesus just saw him and said, "Your sins are forgiven you." That's right. Uh, that's one of the points I was trying to make. Yes. That's right. When he says your sins are forgiven, you better listen, right? Okay. A little aside from this, a little note aside from this, is we have this idea that God takes their sins from the Old Testament, and somebody once told us he's rolling them forward. He's rolling all their sins forward. So we kind of see God pushing uh, this big ball of sins forward, right, until Jesus comes. Because we say there's no forgiveness until Jesus dies, right? Okay. Okay. Well, Jesus hasn't died here. How can he say to this man, your sins are forgiven? He didn't say your sins will be forgiven. He says your sins are forgiven. How can he do that? Because he has the authority. God can forgive sin. God can forgive these people for their sins over here because they offered animal sacrifices or they, they, they followed him. But now, that's not the payment for the sin, though he forgave them for their sin. He forgave them. Every year they were supposed to remember that there had to be a price paid for their sins. 
That's the day of atonement. The day of atonement is every day God remembered, oh yeah, I got to pay for your sins. Not your sins aren't forgiven. It's I have to pay for your sins. I have to pay for them. I have to pay for them. I have to pay for them. Every year he remembered their sins until the new covenant comes. And then God says, I don't have to remember your sins anymore. They're paid for. Lourdes? Right. That's right. And the point I'm making is God, for, Jesus forgave him and said it's done, not it will be done. It's forgiven. Now, of course, Jesus was, was if I can use the word assuming, Jesus knew that the price would be paid for his sins. And that's why he could say your sins are forgiven because he knew they would be paid for. But, but the payment of the sins is different than the pronouncement of the uh, forgiveness. Yes. Right. They apologize. But if they don't, we also have the power within ourselves to forgive them. That's right. We're, we're supposed to forgive people whether they, re yeah, whether they repent or re whether they ask for it or not. We're supposed to try to forgive people. That's right. All right. So uh, he says, which is easier to say, your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, get up and walk? Now, we can look at that, we can look at that paralyzed guy and go, get up and walk. Well, we said it. It's pretty easy. But what happened? Nothing. So when it says to say, it means to do, to make him get up and walk. Can you and I immediately take a man who's, a, who's lame and just say, get up and walk? No. no. Who can? God can. God can do that. Right? Okay. So now here's what he... Yeah. Right. Right. Who really believe they have that power. Right. Yep, that's right. Now, let's see what he says here. Verse 24. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he says to the paralytic. Now, why is Jesus doing this? He's, he's giving them evidence that this Son of Man, this guy is called the Son of of man as authority on earth. Now, uh, what does the expression son of man mean? What? He was born, he was born of a woman. But he's a human. Pedro, are you a son of man? Yeah, he's, son of, he's a son of a man. He's also the son of a woman, right? The expression son of just simply means we have the characteristics of a, of a man unless you're using a bad sense, which is why we have those words that we shouldn't use. But son of is an idiom that means you have the characteristics of, and so man. So he says, basically what he's saying is, so you will know that I, who am the son of man, has authority on earth to forgive sins. Now, there's also, in Daniel here, in Daniel chapter 7, and I believe it's verse 14. It's pretty close to verse 14 if it's not 14. But in Daniel chapter 7, where Daniel is, is talking about the fact that, that God's going to establish his kingdom, okay? And, and he talks, it's in the context of the four beasts and the four kingdoms. He says down here in verse 13, Daniel 7 and verse 13, it says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples and nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will, not, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So God says that there's going to be a son of man. He's going to be a son of man who is going to have the authority of the kingdom. There is one like the son of man who comes up to the ancient of days and God gives him the kingdom. And so I would suggest to you that part of what's going on here is not just that Jesus the man is, uh, has the power, 
But Jesus, the, the, but Jesus the man, this man, this son of man, this individual human being is the one who has the right of the kingdom. He is the one who Daniel said was going to receive the kingdom. Now, they're going to reject Jesus when he claims to be the Messiah. They're going to reject him. But Jesus is pointing out that he's the son of man that has authority. And by the way, if you have a kingdom, then what do you have? Authority. You can't have authority without having some kind of domain or some kind of rule. Remember the word kingdom means rule or reign. Okay, we have, uh, uh, he has the, the rule or the reign that's under consideration. All right, so if we go back to where we're back over here in Luke, uh, it says in verse 24, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he says to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your stretcher and go home. Now, if the guy stays in his stretcher and can't get up, what do you know? Jesus lied. Jesus doesn't have authority. Because I can tell a guy in a stretcher, get up and walk. But he's just going to sit there. If he's crippled, he's just going to, he's just going to lay there. I, I don't have authority to do it. I can't get him to stand up on his own. But if the man gets up and walks, what does that tell you? All right. So here's what I want you to understand. Jesus is taking us from a... From a... Um, an event that you cannot see to an event that you can see to prove the event that you cannot see. That's what he's doing. What he's saying is, if this guy gets up and walks, and you see him walk, then you will know that his sins have been what? Forgiven. If he doesn't get up and walk, then his sins aren't forgiven. Because can you see a guy's sins uh, who's forgiven? Can you look at somebody, can you go to look at Chad and go, oh, Chad, you still have one sin on you today. They haven't all been forgiven. Can, can we do that? No. We, we, we don't know. As far as we know, Chad's a good guy, and God's forgiven for all his sins, right? We don't know. Uh, if, if, he was, if he did some things he shouldn't have done this morning, he asked God to forgive him. God forgave him. We, we can't see it. But we can see this guy, this paralytic guy who is crippled, who, we, who, who you can't just say to a crippled guy, get up and walk, and he does it, unless you have authority or power because you're the one that's going to receive the kingdom, okay? So when he says to him, get up and walk, if he gets up and walks, then you know that his sins were also what? Which is how we know that if you get baptized in Jesus' name, you can have your sins forgiven. You can't see the sin sitting on top of the water in the baptistry. You, you can't see the, the sins floating away. But we do know that because Jesus did these kinds of events, these kinds of things, we know that if Jesus says our sins are forgiven when we're baptized, then our sins can be forgiven, right? So let's see what happens here. Yes. You can see the consequence of sin. Right, right. You, you can see it. Right, you can see a change in the person, but you still can't actually see their sin that has been forgiven, right? God, God's the only one who knows for sure whether they're forgiven or not. Okay, but yeah, but, but, but that's right. Okay, so he says, I say to you, get up and walk, uh, get up and pick up your stretcher and go home. And immediately he got up before them, picked up what he had been laying on, and went home glorifying God. So, what happened? He was healed. Uh, how long did it take? A couple of weeks? A couple of days? A couple of hours? It was immediately. That's what he's getting at. Immediately. So, Jesus healed his bones, his ligaments, his, his, his 
you know, whatever was broken or whatever, however he was paralyzed, God took care of all of that in an instant, and he got up and walked away without rehab, without going in, into rehab for a couple of weeks to, to regain his strength. Happened immediately. Leroy and then Norman. Have you said forgiven like that? Have you said forgiven of your sins? That doesn't mean that you're not going to sin anymore. Right. You're still going to be a sinner. Right. right. Absolutely. Norman? Right. But he didn't reason that. He just got up. Right. It's like Mary had Jesus. She could ask questions about it. She had Jesus have faith. That's right. So faith played that a part. That's right. And, and just faith played the part in just them just bringing him in, right? Uh, and, and knowing that Jesus could heal this fella. And so, so that, like you said, there was a lot of faith there. That's exactly right. Uh, all right. So it says, and immediately got up before them, picked up, picked up what he had been laying on and went home glorifying God. Jesus is there, but he gets up and goes home. And he goes home because why? Jesus told him to go home. Yeah, no, Jesus told him to go home, so, so he goes home. But it's interesting that Jesus doesn't tell him, and follow me. Jesus says, go home. And the guy went home how? Walking and glorifying God. Let me suggest to you that that is the way you and I follow God. We follow God by going home and glorifying him. That's how we, that's how we follow God. You don't follow God by just coming to church and doing church stuff and then going home and doing whatever you want. We go home and we glorify God at home. That's what we do. That's how we follow him. And, and that's what this man was supposed to do. Uh, somebody over here first, I think, uh, or Linda and then Katie. That's right, yeah. Like you said, God in the Old Testament was constantly trying to prove to them that he was God, right? God was taking care of them. He fed them in the wilderness, crossing the Red Sea, giving them the law. He's constantly trying to prove to them, I'm God, I'm God, but they followed the idols, right? And, and so that's what Jesus is doing here. He's trying to get them to understand, I'm God. You don't have to follow these religious leaders who are trying to tell you stuff that I haven't told you. You know, listen to what they tell you when it comes to them reading the law, but they're not your guide. You follow me. Yes, pumpkin. Right. Right. I, I think I think we need to be open to the fact that God does do things, but but uh, and God can whenever if ever He wants to do a miracle. It's not like God can't do a miracle. God God can do whatever He wants. But I mean, um, actually see it. Right. And that's why I say we need to be open to what God does do for us in a what you and I might call a non miraculous way. But yet we know that it was God. And we need to be open for that and, and watch out for it rather than just looking for, I got to see some, you know, supernatural event. Uh, yes. I noticed that the Lord, for me, will still repeat of his sin. He told some of them to go to the priest. Right. Now he told this man to go home. So right. Give me some. Well, uh, in, in the ones that he would tell to go to go tell the priest, right. those are people that he would, that he would heal uh, who were, who the priests would have considered unclean. This paralytic guy would not be unclean. He would still be able to go to service and, go, and be among the, the people. He wasn't considered unclean. So there's, there's, no, there's no reason he has to go to the priest to prove that he's now clean. The people that Jesus sent to the priests 
were people who they needed to verify that they'd become clean in, in the legal sense. And so that's the difference. But they all were the believers, though, right? Well, Jesus is dealing with the Jewish community. When you say they're not all believers, what do you mean? Sure. Well, maybe this will help. The people that Jesus sent to the priests mm -hmm. were always Israelites. He didn't send Gentiles to the priests. Okay. He sent Israelites okay, who understood the law. Yeah. Okay. And then I think does somebody in the back have a question first for? Okay. I was just going to say, if I had been paralyzed and Jesus healed me, you better believe I'm going to follow him. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's exactly right. So let let uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Verse 26. It says, And they were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God. And they were filled with fear, saying, We have seen remarkable things today. Well, what remarkable things did they see? Well, they saw this healing, right? They saw this healing. Now, here's what you and I need to remember. I'm not so sure God considers that such a remarkable thing. What God considers a remarkable thing is this one. Your sins are forgiven you. The physical was proof of the spiritual. The only reason he did the physical was to prove to you the spiritual. And that's why Jesus later on was going to tell people, don't come follow me because you ate bread, but follow me because you saw signs. You see, they're coming to Jesus because they see these things. People are healed. Jesus says, well, I'm glad you're being healed, but that's not why I came. I didn't come to heal you. I came to forgive you for your sins. I came for you to have a relationship with God. That's why I came. That's what you ought to be concerned about. That's what, uh, that's what really ought to, ought to get you excited is your sins can be forgiven, whether you're paralytic or whether you're not. Amen. That's, that's what Jesus was getting at. He wasn't just getting at I can heal people. He was getting at... I'm the one who, for, who can forgive you. And that's why they said they were all struck with astonishment and became, began glorifying God. Now, what I find interesting is it says they began glorifying God. It doesn't say they glorified Jesus. It says they glorified God. Well, that's because you have to understand that the Gospels are designed to take people from being introduced to Jesus and then looking at Jesus as a teacher. And then they look at Jesus as something greater than a teacher until finally... At the end of all the Gospels, they come to the understanding that Jesus really is God. And so that's part of this transition here that you're seeing. They saw what Jesus did. They glorified God. Well, wait, wait. He has the authority to forgive sin. He just forgave sin. But to glorify God up in heaven, you haven't quite got it yet. You're close, but you haven't quite got it yet. Until you turn and look at Jesus and say, you're the son of God. You're God's son in the flesh. That's what the Gospels are designed to get us to do. Katie? That's right. <laughs> right. That's right. Right. I know. Pretty amazing, huh? And, and the reason he did that is because Jesus wanted to show you that the Son of Man has power to forgive sin. He wants to forgive you for your sins. That's why he came. He came to forgive us for our sins. He loves us. He wants us to have a relationship with God. Whether you're a cripple or not isn't going to affect your relationship with God. Your sins are. That's what's going to affect your relationship with God. Jesus says, I can take away your sins. I have authority to do that. Listen to me. Follow me. Yes. <laughs> right and, and and he was he, he certainly was that's what the that's what the 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 paralytic was doing as he was walking around and going home all right any other questions or thoughts on that before we move on yeah what about the owner of the house <laughs> well, yeah <laughs> well we're, we're hoping his two friends hung around and maybe and maybe put the tiles back where they go <laughs> 
That's right. Okay, uh, verse 27. It says, after that, in other words, after that happened, he went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi. Now, uh, as we do this, how do you think the scribes and the Pharisees, what do you think they're thinking after he did that? They're still scratching their head because they said, only who can forgive sin? But Jesus says, but I can make this man walk and you guys can't. So therefore his sins must have been forgiven. So the Pharisees are like probably scratching their heads going, is, is he saying what we think he's saying or is he saying something else? Is he just saying, I have some power that God gave me down here in order to do that? And so this chapter, chapter five, is really, really uh, a, a slam on the scribes and the Pharisees and the ruling religious class in their day. And so he says in verse 27, and after he went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. Now, again, this isn't the very first time that, that Jesus meets Matthew, uh, but Jesus sees him and calls him. Now, when he calls him, I uh, want you to notice what kind of work he was doing. What kind of work was, he was a tax collector. How did the Jews feel about tax collectors? <laughs> well, the tax collectors loved the money, but how, how did the Jews feel about the tax collectors? They were traitors. They were traitors. They're taking money from the people and paying the army of Rome to keep us under their control. They're traitors. The Pharisees had come and the scribes had come all the way to see Jesus. They're hanging around with Jesus. And as Jesus is walking by, and no doubt the crowds are with him, he sees this guy sitting at the, uh, in the tax table and he says, follow me. Right. But how do you think that would rate with the uh, scribes and the Pharisees? You know, uh, now, G does Jesus know what he's doing? Does he really know what he's doing? Does he know what these, guy what, what these guys are doing and who they're helping? Why is he calling him? All right, let's see verse 28. And he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. So Matthew willingly gave up his, his business in order, to, in order to follow him. Uh, what's also interesting is, is you have... In, in the 12 apostles of Jesus, you have a tax collector who is looked at as a Roman sympathizer, and you have a zealot. A zealot is somebody who wants to destroy the Roman Empire. They, 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 they revolt against the Roman Empire. They do everything they can to get rid of the Roman Empire. It's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of like if, if you, if you, if you uh, talk to Nico very much, okay? Uh, Nico's very conservative, and he's a Republican, and he thinks all the other parties are bad, right? And, and so that's, that's kind of his view. And, and, and so uh, one of the things that you need to understand is God has all kinds of people in his kingdom. He has Republicans, he has Democrats, he has independents, he has, uh, he has people who, who don't claim any party, right? Because uh, uh, Jesus wants them all. Jesus wants all, everybody to be saved. So he follows him. Now verse, 20, there verse 29. And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. And there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with, him, with them. So what kind of people were there? That's right, tax collectors and sinners. Uh, uh, Matthew invited his friends. Well, he's a tax collector. What kind of friends would he have? Work friends. He has friends from work, right? So he invites his work friends, and they're tax collectors, and he invites other people. So there's other people that are there as he's, th as he's throwing this dinner party. Nice. Yes. Right. Yes, Matthew and Levi are the same person. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, if I, if I didn't meant to clear that up, sorry about that. Yeah, so Levi and Matthew are the same person. Okay, and, and, and so they're reclining. Uh, okay. uh, he says, uh, and there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with him. Now, remember when they ate, they would sit on the ground basically on cushions. Tables were real low, and they would, you know, all share the stuff that's on there. So, so they're all eating together. Now, realize that eating together was more than just eating together. 
you were you would eat together with people that were your friends. We generally don't eat with our enemies. We generally don't eat with strangers. You might eat in a restaurant that has strangers, but you're not eating with them at your table. You, you invite your friends to your table. And so as Jesus then decides to recline and eat with these people, basically what he's saying is, is I'm accepting you. I, you know, I am here with you, right? Now let's see what happens in verse 30. The Pharisees and the scribes began grumbling at his disciples. So they wouldn't actually talk to Jesus. They began to murmur and, and say snide remarks to the disciples uh, as saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? So what are they saying? Why are you eating with these tax collectors and sinners? Don't you know who they are? Don't you know they're sinners? Okay. Verse 31. And Jesus answered and said to them, It is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. Jesus says, let me give you an example. Does the doctor hang around well people or sick people? Sick people. Why does he hang around sick people? Because <laughs> they're sick. And he's a doctor. He can help them. Katie. That's exactly right. The Pharisees felt like they were okay. They were, they were good. They didn't really need somebody to save them. Yep. And they what? can interpret the law to make it look like they're not sinners. That's right, yep. Whatever they're doing. Yep, and, and, that, and that's why Jesus gave them the example of the sinner and the publican. You remember the sinner and the, the, and the publican? Or the, the Pharisee and the publican? And the Pharisee said, Lord, I fast twice a day. I give tenth, or, or fight twice a week. I give tenth of all that I have. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm glad I'm not like that guy over there. He's pointing to the, to the publican, and the publican's beating his chest, doesn't even raise his eyes to God and says, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. God says, he's the one that went away justified because he's looking to God to help him. Norman. Well, don't we see here that the, the Pharisees considered themselves religious people? Right. And Jesus was the Savior, he would be around religious people. Right, exactly. He that That's right. That yep. That's right. Yep. Yep. That's right. And so, and so he says, it's not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. Now, if you're sitting at the table and you're hearing this, Jesus just called you what? Sick. He just called you sick. Now, if that bothers you, you probably don't want to be there. But if it doesn't bother you, if you realize you're sick, you're glad you're there. Okay. Yes, exactly, yes. There you go, that's right. I'm sorry? That's right, yep. He, he says, it is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So who did he come to call? Sinners repentance so let's see what should i do when jesus heals me and he forgives me of my sins and i go home glorifying him i should just invite church people to my house i should just hang around church people i should do everything with just church people uh, because those wicked sinful people out in the world uh, might mess me up well maybe at the beginning you might want to do that till you get a little stronger but eventually what should we be doing we should be helping those people who don't know about Jesus. We should be talking with them. We should be associating with them. Not doing what they do, but associating with them to help them learn about Jesus, to learn the difference between religion and Jesus and serving him. And that's, that's, what, we're supposed to, that's what we're supposed to be doing. <clears throat> and so Jesus says, that I haven't come, come to call the, the, the righteous, but sinners. Jesus loves us. He loves the sinners. He wants to help the sinners. He's just like a doctor who likes helping people. He wants to know where the sick people are. He wants to go help them. He, he's got an answer for, for their sickness, and he wants to help them. <clears throat> All right. Any question in that far? All right. 33. Now, I'll keep all of this in context that, he's, that this is basically talking against the scribes and the Pharisees, okay? Because then you have in verse 33, real quick, and they said to him, teacher, 
The disciples of John often fast and offer prayer uh, prayers. Uh, the disciples of the Pharisees also do the same. But your but yours eat and drink. So this next section tells us the difference between how the Pharisees and, and those people uh, are, are acting and Jesus' disciples are acting, and they see a difference. They see a difference in the way they're acting. <laughs> the disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees, what do they do? What do you say they do all the time? They fast. They fast. Uh, uh, I'm not talking about for diet, but when's the last time any of you fasted? Don't raise your hands. But when you're talking about religious fast, we don't religiously fast a lot. I mean, we don't have days when I say, you guys got to fast today. We, we don't do that. Well, why? Because we're Jesus' disciples. There's a difference between the way the disciples of the Pharisees and John acts and the way that Jesus' disciples act. And the problem is, is the Pharisees can't see it. They don't understand the difference. And that's why they're saying, why doesn't Jesus' disciples fast? We fast. We fast. The, the, the scribes fast. Why don't they fast? John's disciples fast. Why don't they fast? We've got to come back next week to find the answer. We're starting verse 34 next week. Let's have a prayer. Lord God and Father in heaven, we just praise you and thank you because you are our God. You are the one that we serve and the one that we follow. We do not follow after religious leaders of our world or those who claim to be religious leaders. We thank you so much for uh, uh, individuals who lead us by example, Father, for those who are elders in your church, that we can look at their life and see how they follow you so that we might follow you. But we're especially thankful, Father, that nobody, nobody stands between us and you except Jesus. And so we praise you for that freedom that we have. And we ask, Father, that you help us as we study and as we think about your word to truly understand that you're the one who forgives us for our sins. And so we ask, Father, that you would do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.